Support for Need to Know comes from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, supporting innovation in education, democratic engagement, and the advancement of international peace and security. Learn more at Carnegie.org. Welcome to the Need to Know podcast from the Wilson Center, a podcast for policymakers available to everyone. Always informative, nonpartisan, and relevant, we go beyond the headlines to understand the trend lines in foreign policy. Welcome back to Need to Know. I'm your host, John Molesky. Well, the 2022 United Nations Climate Change Conference, or Conference of the Parties of the UNFCCC, more commonly referred to as COP, is just wrapping up. It's the 27th UN Climate Change Conference, this time being held in Egypt. And it says it's coming to a close today as we speak. And we're joined by one of the attendees. He is Wilson Center Latin American Program Fellow, Rayoni Rajo. Hi, Rayoni. Great to see you. Great to see you, too. And when Rayoni is not at the Wilson Center or attending COP, he's an associate professor of environmental management and social studies of science at the Federal University of Minas Gerais in Brazil. And uh, he is uh, attending, I think I've done the math correctly, Rayoni, mm-hmm. I believe this is your, your eighth attending a COP it's since 2014. Is that correct? Yeah, almost. But it's seventh because we didn't have a COP during the, during the COVID pandemic, ah. but except for that. Pandemic throws off exactly. all math, doesn't it? <laughs> So just give me a sense of, is, uh, is it ending with a, a whimper or a bang? What's your sense of this particular meeting? Well, so far it looks as more, more as a whimper, uh, mostly because this is a technical uh, COP uh, in which developing countries have tried to push for stronger compromises from the rich countries in terms of finance. And it's not clear that's going to happen. Uh, what I've heard, you know, some of my, my contacts is that yesterday evening, so to see how dynamic things are, uh, the EU has come up with a new proposal, especially in relation to a mechanism called loss and damage, which is a sort of uh, climate insurance from uh, which would, whereby rich countries would pay poor countries when they're struck by, uh, you know, by, dis- by natural disasters linked to climate change, such as the ones we have seen, for instance, recently uh, in Asia. And, uh, and, and then, of course, we have this issue, this kind of tug of war, where the developing countries would like to have money on the table uh, and the developed countries would like to have more guarantees, details, or just push the decision forward. It all comes down to who's going to pay the exactly. bills, right, ultimately. So, so I'm going to backtrack and ask you just to set the general scene for us. So what happens at a COP conference? You know, and, and what? And is there a lot of activity on the sidelines? That's often what you hear about in things like the G20. Give us some sense of the dynamics that you encounter. Okay, so I am at the uh, the COP, you know, the, the the conference of the parties, and that's basically the annual meeting uh, uh, that whereby the main decisions related to the United Nations uh, framework for climate change uh, uh, is, is happens. So basically, you have, just to give a parallel to a country's set of laws, you have uh, the EU main declarations usually done, uh, such as you know the Rio ninety two or the Rio plus 10 or the plus 20, where the main objectives for the, for the world in terms of environmental issues is put forward. Uh, back in 92 in Brazil, during the, uh, the so-called Rio 1992, which was the 92 UN Envir- Environment and Development uh, Conference, it was decided that the U- UN would create uh, a new body called uh, United, Nation, United Nations uh, uh, Framework Convention for Climate Change, UNFCCC, and, and that's the space where different countries convene in order to set out how to accomplish the objectives of the initial convention signed in 1992. And that initial convention had already set out the objective for, to globally reduce greenhouse gas emissions in order to avoid the warming of the planet, uh, which is, is basically the process that causes climate change. Uh, we had then over the years important landmarks such as the Kyoto Protocol uh, in the end of the 90s. And then more recently we had in, in 2015 the, the Paris Agreement. And, uh, and so basically let's say those, you know, the protocol and the Paris Agreements are the, the pieces of legislation, are the laws. And then you have that, 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 that big piece of legislation that you need to have the, the, the detailed legislation explaining how they are going to be applied specifically. So what has been debated since 2015 are mostly the, the finer print detail of how those objectives are going to, 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 hap- to happen and who's going to pay the bill and how and to whom and how that's going to be accounted and other technical matters. Depending on who you're speaking to, uh, no COP would mean that the situation with climate change is 
measurably worse globally. Mm -hmm. But then others say, well, you know, it's a lot of chatter, but not a lot of action, and that the goals are not ambitious enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what, what is your sense of, of that debate? Well, um, they are both true in, in many regards. Um, there has been an attempt, actually the initial design for uh, for the climate conference and for this international mechanism was to basically make an, a global accounting of how much is needed uh, in order to avoid climate change and then top down impose on, on the countries what they should do. And that was pretty much the way the Kyoto Protocol was designed and that established, for instance, that uh, the different rich countries have to reduce uh, more or less 10% of their emissions in relation to uh, 1995. Uh, however, countries have not done a lot of that, and especially the United States was a big flop in that regard because it, it, even though it agreed at the convention to, uh, uh, to, that, to, to the Kyoto Protocol, then US Congress failed to ratify uh, the Kyoto Protocol. And that's why uh, when, when we move forward in 2009, we tried to reach out a new agreement in Copenhagen. That was a big failure uh, because uh, basically rich, uh, the poor countries wanted also that kind of top-down approach, and while at the same time poor countries did not want, especially the big emerging economies such as China and Brazil and India, did not want to also to have that top-down approach imposed on them. And, and so that's why one of the main reasons why it was not possible to reach an, an agreement in 2009. And then finally in 2015 it was reached an agreement, however it's a, it's a mechanism which is very voluntary. So every country basically proposes its own targets and then uh, with a promise that, that those targets are the best what they can do, which is of course a matter of debate. Sometimes they propose uh, targets which are not very ambitious, but then that's part of, of how the current uh, international uh, framework works. So 27 times COP has taken place. It's the 30th anniversary of the adoption of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And this is your seventh go round. Is it possible to kind of gauge the feeling, the atmosphere, the zeitgeist? Is there optimism? Is there pessimism? As you look from year to year, how does this one stack up from your previous experiences? Well, it's, it's certainly, in terms of the, of the negotiations themselves, uh, the, 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 since it's already start off without lots of, of, of expectations, uh, and, and since it was not part of a, of a big process, a landmark such as it was Paris, so it's certainly much less electrifying. Um, and also, uh, in the end, while people really would like to see COPs as this space where big decisions are made, they often, uh, the, the big announcements are now happening more on the sides of the COP uh, rather than in, inside the negotiations themselves. Because we, we have to remember that all the rules which are being agreed here must be agreed in consensus. So sometimes uh, the slower mover kind of sets the rhythm for everybody else. And uh, while in, in parallel, what you have is the opportunity for different countries to go out and basically set their own visions for the future. That's why the, the announcements of the pledges done on, in parallel by world leaders during the COPs are, are becoming more and more important than the climate negotiations themselves. G give us a sense more about who is participating on the sidelines. You know, in, in addition to the, the official government representatives who attend COP as part of the, the, the delegation, who else is there? Is it industry people, experts like you, academics, analysts, others? Give us a sense of who's there and what those types of interactions mm -hmm. involve. Well, the, the COP started out in the 90s as being very small, very technical. And then you started to see some people from civil society that would basically come here to ask their governments, to ask basically the world and the decision makers to move faster in relation to climate change. But over the years, it has become a big, uh, you know, business conference. So you, you don't not only have the NGOs, but you have leaders, you have people from industry. Actually, there is a recent report by NGO uh, actually analyzing the, the, the growing presence of uh, lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry coming to COPs. And, and then you have different debates uh, happening in parallels that want to influence mainstream discussions. For instance, there is a very strong push from the fossil fuel industry to present uh, uh, the transition from coal to gas as a climate solution, which is something that a large part of the academic and, and the scientific community and the, and the NGOs uh, would not like that because it's still a fossil fuel nevertheless. So you have, uh, even though it, it emits less than coal, so you have those different debates taking place in parallel and, and quite often those debates end up becoming uh, central pieces. And that's why nowadays you have 
uh, the, the, the negotiations themselves, which are more or less the same size. And then you have this mushrooming uh, space for civil society and for parallel events taking place on the sides. Nowadays, cops are cities, you know, they're really huge. You get lost very easily amongst they stand yeah. from different countries, companies, uh, associations, as they try to present their own view uh, advoc ad and do the advocacy for their own positions. What, what you're describing sounds a lot like a legislative process in just about every any governing body on the planet, with lobbyists on the outsides and industry and other people having their say. But, and you talk about the city and the size of this thing, but then a, a notable person not there, one of the protesters who's become a, a, a face of the anti uh, climate movement, if that's the right terminology, I know it's not, uh, Greta Thur Thunberg. And, and I know there still have been protests, mm -hmm. but what's happening there on the sidelines as it relates to people who are protesting what they would call a lack of effective government response? Yeah, you have different movements that have been historically active here. Uh, maybe the most important one are the ones linked to climate justice. Uh, and so, for instance, every morning, uh, as a way to kind of remember uh, negotiators about what this is all about, they, they meet outside and then, you know, they would shout out things such as, you know, we want climate justice now, and to just emphasize the importance of that, you might have, you know, then historically changed from COP to COP, but for instance, at some point, in some cops, they were distributing, uh, you know, uh, vegetarian sandwiches just to advocate, advocate for people to eating less meat and, and switch, switch into a vegetarian diet, uh, or you know, the first station free chocolates, you know, to call attention to the people of the, of the importance of monitoring forests and avoiding uh, the contamination of the first station in in, in coca uh, in, in cocoa supply chains. So you have those different activities taking taking place more in the public. And, uh, and then most importantly, you have these spaces dedicated by the different countries and by the different organizations to, to ad advocate their, their perspectives. So we've talked about who isn't there. Uh, and uh, let's talk about some of the people who are there in particular, the, the new president of, of your home base, Brazil, uh, the return mm -hmm. of President Lula, who has uh, made quite a splash and is saying he wants to be a, a climate leader, a climate champion. Tell us about Lula's presence at the conference, what he's announced, and, and what the prospects are. Yeah, it, uh, to, first of all, we, we must clarify that it's a very odd position because Brazil just won the election, but he's not the president. And, and uh, he's president-elect. Right. And, and nevertheless, he was officially invited by the president of, of Egypt. And, and he was given to him, uh, actually, a, a chief of state treatment. You know, I, I took a picture myself of this little detail, the car in which he was driven to the COP which is actually a very nice car, but with the flag of Brazil just on the tip of the car, as it's usually the case of chiefs of, of, of state. Uh, and, and also the following around him was impressive. You know, the, uh, uh, there was an article uh, in one of the main newspapers, I believe it's writers, that, that was saying that, that Lula got a, a rock star uh, 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 you know, treatment here at the COP, and, and, I can, and I'm an eyewitness of that. Uh, especially because you know, Brazil, it, it's, it's a very central country when it comes to, 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 to climate issues, especially because it hosts the largest uh, tropical forest in the world. And uh, as some of, of, of you know, usually put it, uh, when it comes down to forest issues, Brazil is Saudi Arabia. You know, you cannot avoid talking to Brazil and, and really having him engaged. And, and for, for the last four years, uh, Brazil had, uh, you know, basically become a much, more hard, much harder actor to deal with, especially in the first uh, three years of, of the Bolsonaro government, in which during the... Um, during which uh, Salas was the minister of environment and, and, and basically he, rather than helping out the negotiations and, and putting Brazil in a leadership position, he was actually you know, putting the world in handsome. Uh, asking you know, money now or I will let more deforestation take place. Quite, you know, <laughs> to, just to summarize things, but that's the meaning at the end of the day. Uh, just to give an example, uh, during the COP uh, in Madrid uh, in, 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 uh, in 2020, uh, it was Friday, uh, actually, it was actually Saturday, very, very late. Everybody was about to close the final text, and just out of a tantrum, basically, Salas raised his hand and said, oh, I don't agree, including oceans in the decision, which is a technical, I mean, it's something that Chile has asked just because Chile is a very sea, sea, sea you know, uh, onwards country, and he wanted that to be mentioned there in the, the, the COP decision without any further consequence. And Brazil wanted that out. For what? Just to hold the, whole, the world hostage. And then, just mm -hmm. to then revert that position in the morning of, of, of Sunday, where 
where you know literally thousands of people had to change their flights and you know and and so just to give an idea of the disaster that brazil has been so having brazil back and and, and having lula as a symbol of that was very strongly received by the people present here not only the brazilians but you know the whole the whole community uh and what lula has said in a very interesting uh uh, uh um uh, very interesting speech he gave uh, uh a couple of days ago was mostly around this this notion that uh okay it's fine brazil is a leader brazil is going to do its job is going to reduce deforestation to zero but we need also stronger international governance over over climate issues and then in a way that very explicitly puts the us in a frying pan said we cannot have decisions which are signed here which then in, when the when the, the leaders go back to their home countries are not ratified by their by their congresses and then are not done in practice because the world needs action and so in a sense he rather than staying on the defensive which is the, which was a tradition position that brazil has been in, in in the climate negotiations trying to basically fend off criticisms related to the frustration of the amazon brazil is now on the attack you know and trying to to score goals mm -hmm. you know to make the parallel with the the soccer uh, uh, world you know a world cup that's going to start soon and basically putting more pressure on different countries now we find out if uh, president lula can shoot straight using your soccer anal exactly. analogy so that's clearly one of the headlines coming out of COP27 is the return of Brazil and the assertions by uh, uh, President-elect Lula that they are, will be major players. What other headlines uh, are emerging from this COP? Well, there is one, one aspect in particular, coming back to the negotiations by themselves, uh, which is, is the issue of loss and damages, uh, which was one of the main requirements and the main demands from the developing countries during the Paris Agreement, uh, in which, in which, in which was, by, by, by the way, one of the aspects that enabled the unlocking of the negotiations as it failed back in 2009. So that was a really central part of the final arrangement. And it's basically uh, an insurance. And, and so the key thing here is to see who's going to pay to pay the bill as different countries fight to see the position on that. It's difficult to see now what's going to be uh, the position, but it, that might be the decision on that certainly is going to be uh, a big headline. Or uh, the failure of finding a solution to that might also be uh, a, a big uh, headline. Um, also, I think it might be marked by the fact that it was a very empty uh, cop in terms of new commitments. And just as a comparison, uh, mm -hmm. the cop in Glasgow, also due to the articulation made by the UK government, which was much stronger, uh, you had a very, very important uh, pledge by the West government with China, uh, which included different areas, including, for instance, uh, cleaning uh, international trade from deforestation, but also reducing fossil fuels. Uh, you had the, the, the Glasgow Forest Declaration, uh, so you had those parallel decisions, which are not official to the COP, but you have very high-level leaders saying uh, and putting forward important statements. We did not have such high-level statements and compromises done here. Uh, basically, just what what Biden has come here to say was basically to to show what has already been decided in the U.S. with the with the Inflation Act, uh, and so. I think that this COP probably is going to be marked also by this uh, uh, this lack of action. I would say. So, so what will happen in the final hours as as we sit and record this discussion? Uh, you're at uh, approximately 5:30 p.m. Egyptian time, and I'm sitting here at 10:30 a.m. Uh, Washington D.C. time, and this is the official last day, or at least the advertised last mm -hmm. day. But it's not uncommon for these things to spill over into the evening or maybe even to the next day. W what is your sense of the momentum right now? Is it, you said it's sort of a bit of a whimper versus a bang. Is that, it, will it just peter out, the clock runs out and it's over and everybody goes back to their home country and gets to work? Or is there still a chance mm -hmm. that there could be some surprise mm. or something significant in the final hours? Well, uh, right now, the more technical decisions, the more inconsequential decisions, or the decisions in which there's more consensus, have been already decided and and that usually slowly uh becoming part of the bigger cop decision so you have this sort of like in in, a, in in congress you have the committees deciding on specific issues and then those issues are pushed up to the bigger uh, cop decision and, uh, and 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 right now what you have is the, is the host country so egypt uh, aided by a selected group of of countries uh basically trying to negotiate you know the the key points and the most uh, let's say red lines from different countries in order to try to find 
a, a solution, so basically a text that uh, is good for everybody. And then as they, un they un uh, basically reach that kind of text by talking to this subgroup of countries, then the text is presented in the plenary. Uh, which right now, as we talk, I'm just, you know, the, the, the plenary of the COP is just behind me. Uh, all the delegates are sitting there just waiting for the presidency of the COP to present this text. And then you have the reaction of the different countries in relation to that text. So uh, might, what we might see quite often is basically the countries either accepting that and, and or, for instance, rejecting and then that re requiring further uh, uh, for the discussion. What might also happen is a situation where almost everybody agrees and then you might have one or another per person or country uh, which is not as central, let's say, as US, China, and, and then which might be against and then sometimes people close an eye to those protests and quickly just go through, oh, so everybody agreed and then there is an, a, a round of applauses and everybody goes home. So you also that have that kind of, you know, uh, uh, as, as the, 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 the final objective approaches, this rushing off just to avoid that minor uh, criticism might block an, uh, an agreement where most countries are, are very keen to, to, to accept. Yeah, the, the term herding cats comes to mind. It's how difficult exactly. it is to get everybody to uh, mar march in lockstep. Now, before we close, I want to ask you about the host country, Egypt. How has it done? This is, as you said, it's a city. It's a major undertaking. The, uh, and, and people coming in from all over the world. How has the, the host nation done on this, this uh, COP? Well, I, I'm not hearing anything particularly negative about the performance, but neither particularly positive about around the performance. What, what I, I understand is that the UK, as, as the country that has, has hosted the COP for la, uh, the last moment, for the last year, has been helping out also significantly as they were handing over the best uh, the best in to, to to Egypt, and uh, but also I think that the the, the COP in, in Egypt was actually mostly marked by the protests uh, from activists because as we know uh, Egypt is an authoritarian country and there has been uh, actually different arrangements for instance to allow protests inside the COP. So in, in this in that sense, COP has become an exception, a sort of a big embassy within uh, within uh, Egypt. Uh, but outside the streets, you see a lot of policemen. You see people checking uh, passports, nationalities, and and so and also we, we, I as I understand, there has been different arrests of, of protesters here, especially in relation to asking, for instance, for the release of, of polit political prisoners here in Egypt. So I think that has been also one of the tensions we have noticed in relation to to the host country. But overall, has been a, a quite smooth uh, uh, conference. You know, it's 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 a beautiful country, especially. Uh, Charm and shake. The food is great, so I think most people are are, uh, are happy about uh, the event here. Well, Rowney, thanks very much for taking some time from your attendance at the conference to, to give us this insider look and and give us this sense of the the texture of what's going on. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And well, uh, safe travels. We'll see you back in DC See you soon. Okay. Thanks to uh, our listeners as well. Hope you enjoyed this edition of the Need to Know podcast and that you'll join us again soon on Till Then for all of us at the Wilson Center. I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us.